Welcome back to the 8-bit computer, um, which as you can see is still happily uh, calculating all kinds of arithmetic operations, uh, the Fibonacci numbers, the multiplication tables and the power series. And um, we started looking at the ALU, the arithmetic and logical unit in the last episode, and we'll continue talking about that today. Um, what we looked at last week is uh, how we can allow these mathematical uh, uh, calculations to interact with the rest of the computer. And so we decided that uh, we would connect our ALU in such a way that one of the operands always comes in from the bus on these blue wires. And the second operand uh, we can control as either being the B register, which comes into the ALU through these green wires, or it can simply be a hard-coded value, uh, which we've set uh, in the electronics here. And we have a control logic signal here, the, the B ALU, which tells the ALU whether its second operand should come from the B register or if it should be a hard-coded value inside the logic circuits here. And we also saw that uh, because we want to output the result of the calculation back onto the bus, we actually need to latch it and store it in a, in a temporary register, which we have here. And so any calculation result, after it's been uh, worked out by the LU, will be stored in this register whenever it's told to do so using this uh, ALU write signal from the control logic. And then in a second clock uh, pulse, the uh, value which is in that ALU can then be output onto the bus uh, through this buffer. And the reason we do that is because uh, we can't input from the bus and output onto the bus at the same time. And so this week uh, we're going to have a look at the actual calculation unit. And so the job of the calculation unit is to take these two inputs uh, coming from in the, the bus and the B register or a, a fixed value and to perform arithmetic. And, uh, we decided that we were going to support 11 different arithmetic operations on our operands and we're using four control signals, uh, which are these four, to tell the, the ALU, the calculation unit, exactly what sort of operation it should perform. And then once it's done that, the output from that should go uh, into, into this temporary register. Now, if you've been following along Ben Eater's series, um, then you'll know that he, uh, his ALU does implement addition and subtraction. Uh, and so there are certainly ways of, of constructing adder and subtraction circuits. And so using those, we could of course build a, a basic ALU. Um, now we can use those circuits to also implement increment and decrement by one, because those are simply additions and subtractions uh, in the end. Um, but of course that does leave out all of the logical operations and it doesn't necessarily provide us with all of the flags that, that we might be interested in. But we could build on that and, and expand it and, and add some more gates and, and of course logical operations are very easy to perform in gates. Uh, we have all kinds of AND and ALL gates available. Uh, so we could build some uh, combinational circuit uh, to, to perform all of the operations that we're interested in. Now, if, if we were to do that, um, I expect that that circuit would be three or four breadboards large at the least, uh, considering that, that, we're, that we really want to support 11 different operations. Um, so, um, since I'm new to electronics anyway, I, I just started looking around uh, at the different chips which are available in, in the 74 series to see if there's anything there that might uh, reduce the chip count, which, you know, in in, a, in the worst case, uh, could be quite considerable. And as it turns out, there is a chip which could uh, very well suit our purposes. And in fact, it's this one, the 74LS382. Uh, and the 382 is, is this, let's say, second version of it. Um, and it provides a number of uh, arithmetic and logic operations. Um, in fact, the arithmetic operations are simply addition and subtraction, but uh, we can perform the subtraction in, in both directions. So we can subtract the first from the second operand or the second from the first operand. 
And in addition, it provides logical operations. This is an exclusive or, this is an or, and this is an and. Um, and so to control this, uh, the, these operations, the chip, uh, it's a four bit ALU. Um, it provides uh, four input bits for an A input and four input bits for a B input. Um, and it provides the output of an operation on, on what it calls uh, uh, function bits, two and three. And we can choose the operation by setting three control bits, which it calls uh, S0, S1, and S2, which are here. And not only that, um, it also provides a carry in for uh, arithmetic operations, which is this bit, and it provides a carry out, which it calls uh, CN plus four. So the idea is you can chain that to uh, another instance of this same chip. Um, and so using uh, the, the, these six operations which it provides, um, it turns out that we are actually able to provide the 11 functions that the, the we are planning um, in this computer. As we know, uh, the arithmetic operations are in fact uh, a series of uh, is a series of combinational logic, and of course, uh, so are these logic operations. And so we could sort of imagine that it consists of a series of selectors, which then determine uh, another series of logic gates, which perform the operation. So, uh, if we look at uh, page three of the data sheet, you can see that uh, it it actually consists of a whole bunch of combinational logic uh, and I'm sure if you were to go through all of that with a tooth comb you'd find out that, that this logic circuit, all of these logic gates together, will actually perform these operations. And so that's what I've gone with. If you look at my ALU you'll see that I have two of those 74 LS 382s. And now um, you might be wondering, why am I suddenly using the LS series of chips? Most of this computer is, is in HCT. Well, as it turns out, I couldn't find a 74 HCT 382. It doesn't seem to exist. Perhaps it was never constructed. Uh, but so I'm using a 74 LS 382. Uh, and as I said in, in one of the first episodes, um, the fact that I'm using the HCT CMOS chips and not the HC CMOS chips means that I can actually interact also with LS chips and that's exactly what I'm doing in this ALU and so by using HCT everywhere else uh, in this computer I've been able to integrate it with these uh, LS series chips because uh, this particular function the 74 LS 382 appears to only exist in the LS variant. Supposing we want to add two numbers together. And to keep things simple, we'll uh, limit ourselves to four bits for the moment. So supposing here I want to add nine and five together. And so in binary, those are one, zero, zero, one, and zero, one, zero, one. Well, to add them decimally, uh, that's easy enough. We can add nine and five together. And so that's 14. Um, and so in fact, what we do is we'd, we'd write a four here, and then we'd carry a one for any digits that we might have in this column. So if there was anything in here, if we were adding 19, we'd have to add that one, which we got because this result is 14. So whatever we're adding in this column, but of course in this case there isn't anything, so the answer will simply be 14. And, and we use exactly the same process in binary. So if I want to add this one and this one together, that's of course two, and, and two in binary is, is one zero. And so we'll be writing a zero here and we'll need to carry a one. And so that one will get added there um, because we need to carry that. And But then this column won't carry, so that'll just be a one and that'll be a one. And so that's what the result of that computation would look like. So in this case, we had to carry for, for this addition, uh, but in all of the other bit positions, we didn't have a carry and, and this is the resulting value. And that very nicely corresponds to 14. Um, and so to add two binary bits together, we can actually write, we can actually construct a small circuit using logic gates. And so if we want to add an X bit and a Y bit together, you'll, you'll notice that 
in the case where both of them are equal to 1, the sum is a 2, which is 1, 0 in binary. So the, the bit which is in the same bit position of the number as the two bits we're adding will be a 0. And also, if we add 0 and 0 together, the result will also be a 0. So, um, uh, but of course, if we're adding 0 and 1 together, the result will be 1, as in these two columns. So in fact, the sum bit is an exclusive OR of the two inputs. If they're both equal to 1, that will be a 0. If they're both equal to 0, that will be a 0. But if they're 1, 0, 0, 1, the result will be a 1. But of course, we also need the carry out bit. And the carry out bit uh, will be set if both x and y are 1. So if we're adding 1 to 1, only in that case will we carry, because the result will be 2, which is 1, 0 in binary. Um, but of course that's not enough because, as, as is the case in, in this column, for example, we are indeed adding two bits together, but we're actually adding a third bit to that be because the previous column carried. Um, and so we can chain two of these adders together. And so in the first half adder, we can add the two bits, and that will give us a certain result up here. And then we can add whatever carry in we have from the previous column to that result using another half adder. And so that will give us the actual result, and then the carry will be set if either of these two additions carried. And so using that technique, we can just add two of these together and construct a circuit which, when, which can calculate the addition of three bits. And uh, it can show us a result here. And of course, that's only valid for one single bit. And so if we want to add four bits together, we can simply chain four of these full adders together into something like this. And so here we have the four input bits of the first value, and here we have the four input bits of the second value, and so each of those go to a particular full adder. So this one is for bit position zero, so x zero and y zero, both going into this adder. Uh, and it might carry, and if it carries, well, the result of that carry should obviously be added to bit position number one, to the full adder, which is dealing with bit position one. That's the definition of a carry. And so that carry in is in fact the carry out of bit position zero. And the same applies f f for this adder. So that could carry and that carries in to the next bit position, number two, and that carries on to the last bit position, number three. And so then we can read the sum bits off of, of the sum outputs of all of these full adders. Um, and of course it might happen that the, the sum of these two values turns out to be larger than, than 15, than the largest value that fits into four bits. And so the result of, of adding four bits together might still be a carry. And so we could read that off, off of the carry bit of the last full adder. And we could use that uh, if, if we wanted to add two 8-bit numbers together, because then we could take one of these circuits for the least significant four bits and another one for the most significant four bits and we could chain them together exactly as we chain full others together so we can use this carry output and hook it up to the carry input which we can have over here of another four bit adder which which we might have to the left to calculate the four more significant bits than the ones we're adding here so we can chain those together very nicely and so that's how addition works uh, using um, binary logic circuits. Now we here I've written down a truth table for uh, the full adder circuit which adds two bits together together with a possible uh, input carry. So uh, if all of the input values are zero well then the sums are zero and, and we won't carry. Uh, but if we're adding a one to all zeros then the sum will be a one and we'll still not carry. Same here. Uh, but if we add 1 and 1, then we'll get 2. So the, the same bit position will be a 0, but we'll carry a 1. Here again, we're only adding 1, so no carry. Here, the result will be a 2. So we'll have a, a 0 in the same column as these bits, and the 1 should be added to the column to the left. Same here. And then in, in this last case, we're actually adding three 1s together, and so the result of that is 3, which is 1 and 1 in binary. So our sum column still contains a 1, and in addition, we'll have a carry out. So that's just a truth table for uh, our full adder circuit. Now let's have a look at subtraction.
So supposing I want to subtract, in this case, the value 5 from the value 9 in binary, once again, 1001, subtracted from 0101. Now, of course, in decimal, that's very easy. That will be a 4. Uh, and because 5 is smaller than 9, we don't actually need to borrow anything. So uh, if this had been a 3, well, then we would have had to borrow. If, if we were subtracting 5 from 13, well, then 3 minus 5 uh, wouldn't have been possible. But then we'd have borrowed that 1 into this column, and we'd have subtracted 5 from 13, and we'd have had an 8. So binary works the same way. I can subtract 1 from 1, that'll give me a 0, no problem. I can su subtract 0 from 0, that'll give me a 0, no problem. But I can't subtract 1 from 0, because 0 is smaller than 1. And so I need to borrow. So I need to borrow from this column. Uh, and of course, in binary, I'm not going to add 10 to this column. I'm going to add 2 to this column. And so we'll be now subtracting 1 from 2. And the result of that will be a 1. But I'll have had to borrow 1 from this column. So, so that will be a 0. And so we'll have a 0 here. And so uh, that's exactly what happens. And so we get the value 4, which is in fact correct. 9 minus 5 is 4. Now we could, just as we did for, for additions, uh, build a, a, a circuit using logic gates to perform subtraction. And so we could start by, by simply subtracting two bits from each other, and we'll call that a half subtractor. Um, and once again, uh, we can check that all these values are correct. So if x is 0 and y is 0, such as in this column, uh, the result will be a 0. If x is 1 and y is 1, then the result will also be 0, because 1 minus 1 is 0. And so, so far, this exclusive OR here, to calculate the difference, is correct. But on the other hand, if we're subtracting 0 from 1, then the result will be 1, so, so that's correct. And if we're subtracting 1 from 0, the difference column, so our own column, will still be a 1, so, so that exclusive OR is correct. Uh, but we will have had to borrow, and in fact, that's the only case where we'd have had to borrow. And so indeed, the case where we borrow is the case where x is 0, but y is 1. And so the complement of x is 1, and y is 1, and so that AND gate um, indicates the only case in which a borrow occurred, which is this case, for the half subtractor. But of course, that half subtractor, we can't use it for, for, for example, this calculation, because we're actually subtracting three bits. We're subtracting 0 from 1, and then we're also subtracting 1 from 1. So we're subtracting two different bits from x in this case. And so just as we did for uh, additions, we can chain two of these half subtractors together to give us a full subtractor. And so we can subtract a value of a, a bit value of y from a bit x. And we can also additionally subtract a borrow from a previous column from that same x. And so the first subtraction will, will give a certain result. Um, it might have required the borrow from the next column. But even then, we still need to subtract another, possibly another bit from, from the column to our right. And so that happens here. Here is the second half subtractor. And so its result is it will be the bit that goes into our column. But of course, it might also require the borrow. So if either of these half subtractors require the borrow, then it means the subtraction of, of the particular column I'm interested in caused a borrow out. And so that is a circuit which is able to subtract three bits, two bits from uh, an X bit. And it provides a result and it indicates whether a borrow uh, was required from the column to the left. And so once again, just as for additions, we can chain all of these full subtractors together uh, into a circuit that allows us to subtract two 4-bit numbers from each other. So this circuit can subtract these 4 bits from these 4 bits. And so just as for additions, we have one full subtractor for each of the bit positions, 0, 1, 2, and 3. And the result of, of the difference is, is uh, available here. And if any of these full subtractors resulted in a, in a borrow, well, then we simply chain that borrow to the borrow input of the full subtractor of the column to the left. And, and this one does exactly the same, and so does that one. So this is extremely similar 
to the way we handled the carry inputs and outputs on the full adder circuit. Uh, and so this 4-bit subtractor also has a potential borrow input line and a borrow output line. And so I could, just as for addition, chain several of these 4-bit subtractors together to perform 8-bit subtractions or 16-bit subtractions. And once again, I, uh, all I need to do is to chain the various borrow signals together and then uh, divide parallelly all of my input values uh, and then I can read off my output values. So that's one way in which we could provide subtraction. And of course that, that would require a slightly different circuit from uh, what we needed for addition. And so potentially we, we, we have two circuits, one for addition and one for subtraction. Now this was the truth table which we calculated for additions. So we can do exactly the same for subtractions. So the full subtractor circuit subtracts a value of y from x and also possibly a borrow from a column to the right from the same x. And so if all values are 0, if I'm subtracting 0 and 0, or both from 0, then the difference will be a 0. And if I start with a 1 and subtract all zeros, I'll end up with a 1. But if I start off with a 0 and subtract a 1, then I'll need to borrow. And the result of that borrow will be that I'm actually subtracting from 2, and so I can subtract 1 from 2 and the result will be 1. If I'm subtracting that 1 from a 1, then we're OK, and then the result will be a 0. This is, of course, exactly the same as that. I'm subtracting 1 from 0, so I need to borrow, so I'm subtracting it from 2, so the result is 1, and I had to borrow. And this is exactly the same as that. So if I subtract 1 from 1, the result is 0. I don't need to borrow, and so on. So here I'm subtracting 2 from x, which is 0. So I definitely need to borrow, and once I've borrowed, the result will be 2, and subtracting 2 will result in 0. Now if I start out with a 1, and I want to subtract 2, well, I still can't subtract 2 from 1, so I still need to borrow, but of course after borrowing 2, I'll actually have a 3 in this column, and so 3 minus 2 is, is 1, so the result is 1, but I did need to borrow. All right, so using first principles, we constructed truth tables for, for the full adder circuit and for the full subtractor circuit. Now we're going to play around with these uh, truth tables a little bit and, and observe something interesting. So the first thing I'm going to do is take this uh, full adder truth table and I'm going to shuffle columns around. So in this case what I've done is I've flipped it round. I've, I've taken two columns here, these two columns, and I've moved those all the way to the left. And then I've taken these two columns and I've moved those to the right of that first column. And then I've taken these two and moved them over there. And then I've taken these two and moved them all the way to the right. But I've always moved entire columns. And so the truth table is still exactly the same. If I add 0 and 1 and 0 together, the result is 1 without a carry. Uh, and if I add 1 and 1 and 0 together, the result is 0 with a carry, i.e. 2. And so I haven't changed any of the validity, validity of, of this table at all. All I've done is shifted columns around, so they're in a slightly different order. Now, for this full subtractor, I'm also going to um, manipulate the table a little bit, but I'm going to do something different. What I'm going to do is for this Y row, and for both the borrow in and borrow out rows, I'm going to change these values to their complements. I'm going to show the complements of these values. So what I'm saying is that if y is the complement of 1, which is 0, and if the input borrow is the complement of 1, which is 0, then the difference will be 0, and the output borrow will be the complement of 1, which is 0. So all I'm doing is, is saying the same thing in, in, a, in a somewhat convoluted, complicated way, because I'm, I'm introducing these complements. But another way I could see that is to say that if the complement of y is 1 and x is 0, and the complement of the input borrow is 1, then the difference will be 0, and the complement of the output borrow will be a 1. 
So I could take all of these complements and, and move them onto the input line as well. It would mean exactly the same thing. And now we can make a very interesting observation. Because if we, for just a moment, forget about the fact that we're dealing with complements here, the values from this table and in this table are exactly the same. So take this column, 101, 101, 0101. Or 1, 0, 1. Well, this column, 11001, 11001. If it weren't for these complement operations, those truth tables would be exactly the same. So what does that mean? It means that if I take a full adder circuit, such as this one, which takes x and y values and the carry in, and I calculate a sum and the carry out, if I flip around the y, the carry in and the carry out signals, like this, then what I actually have, that, that's what that truth table operation means, what I actually have is a full subtractor. And so I can transform a full adder circuit into a full subtractor circuit by flipping around the Y signal as well as the carry in and the carry out so that they become a, a, a subtracting Y and a borrow in and a borrow out. And so if I take a 4-bit adder which consists of four full adders. And I flip all of these circuits around to become full subtractors by flipping around all of the Y signals and all of the carry in signals and all of the carry out signals like this. Then I actually have a full subtractor circuit which I've built. But not only that, in fact, by flipping around the carry out so it becomes a borrow out, and flipping around the next carry in so it becomes a borrow in, I have lots of positions here where I've simply changed two, chained two inverters together. And so I don't need those. This is exactly the same circuit. And what's interesting about this is that this inner part of the circuit is in fact a 4-bit adder. And so what I discovered about a single full adder that I can flip the Y bit and the carry input and output bits so as to obtain a full subtractor, well I can do exactly the same for a 4-bit adder. I can take a 4-bit adder which is inside this rectangle here and I can flip its carry input signal and its carry output signal so they become borrow input and borrow output signals and all of its Y inputs. And suddenly I've transformed or I've built a 4-bit subtractor circuit from a 4-bit other circuit. So that means I actually don't need to build a separate subtraction circuit. I can simply manipulate the inputs to my other circuit and it will magically become a subtractor circuit. Now if we look at page 2 of the datasheet of our um, 74LS382, uh, which we are using for our arithmetic and logic operations, um, we can start to understand how it operates, because it uses uh, almost exactly the, the phenomena, let's say, that, that we've just discovered about binary addition and binary subtraction. So if we look first at the addition case, so that's uh, A plus B here, uh, and remember it, it has three inputs that we can use to tell it what operation to perform. So if we set those to low, high, high, it'll perform an addition. And here it tells us how it's going to deal with uh, carries and, and then A and B inputs in the case of an addition. And so it, this is more or less the truth table for the addition that uh, we worked out together. So if uh, A and B are low and the carry is low, then the result is going to be low, um, and so is the carry output. 
Um, and if the carry is high, it will perform the addition, but additionally add whatever's in the carry bit. So for example, this is going to result uh, in, in a, an output of high, but the carry will be low because the two inputs were, were low. Uh, but if one of the inputs is high, uh, then the output will be low, but the carry will be high. So it's, this is sort of the truth table that, that we'd already come up with. But the interesting part is if you look at the minus operations. And so if you look at the minus operations, which are up here, for example, A minus B, well, then you'll see that if the carry is low, and we were, for example, subtracting uh, low from low, which would be zero from zero, you discover that the result is all ones, and, and so that's not a proper subtraction. And the reason is that they are using the inverse of the borrow signal, which as we discovered is in fact the same as the carry signal. And so for this minus to behave as a real minus would do, we need to set the carry high, which in effect means we're setting the borrow in low. And so for subtraction operations, the meaning of, of this carry in and carry out flag, which we have on this ALU, is exactly the inverse of the borrow signal. And, and we discovered that that is the correct thing to do if you're performing a subtraction. So a, a subtraction is in fact an addition whereby one of the operands is inverted um, and the carry in and carry out are inverted to become borrow in and borrow out. And so this minus to perform a, a, a standard subtraction, say zero minus zero, you need to set the borrow low, i.e. the carry high. And performing that subtraction, you'll get a low result, and the carry output will be high, meaning there was no borrow. And so for subtraction, the, the, the carry bit sort of takes on, uh, in fact does take on, the opposite meaning of what a borrow would be for a mathematical subtraction. And so what this line, in fact, means is the borrow in is high. So we're subtracting one from zero because this means borrow in high, i.e. minus one. And so the result of subtracting one from zero is obviously m minus one uh, or all ones and the borrow out. And so a borrow out high corresponds to a carry out low. And so this will go low. And so both the carry in and the carry out uh, for this chip have the opposite meanings of the borrow in and borrow out. And, and uh, so that gives us a small hint of, of how it uh, implements this subtraction uh, internally. Now it does invert the, the second operand for us, so we don't need to also invert the B signals. Uh, that's something that the chip takes care of. And it takes care of it because we told him to do so uh, using these three uh, input signals. Now here are the 11 operations that, that we want our ALU to support for uh, any programs running on our computer. Um, and so the question now becomes, uh, how are we going to implement these 11 operations uh, using the features of, of this 74LS382, which we're going to use? And, and so it has uh, six possible operations, which we can choose from uh, using these S input signals. And then, of course, we can wire up the, its A and B inputs uh, in some way to provide the operation that we're interested in. And of course, it also has a carry input, uh, which we can manipulate. And so uh, we can go through these instructions one by one to understand how we go about implementing them. And so the first one is an addition of uh, some register with the B register. Um, so that register will obviously come in through the bus uh, and from the bus will go into the A input of the 74LS382. And the B input will be uh, connected to the B register and so we can set these uh, selector inputs to use the, the addition operation on the 74LS382 and the carry input will set to zero because uh, we're performing a, a standalone addition here we're, we're not connecting this addition to any other uh, additions or operations that might be occurring and so this is how we'd uh, use the 74LS382 to provide this instruction uh, quite simple in this case so that A is connected to the bus which will 
so we get the value from some register. The B, uh, we decided we'd hard code the B, connect that to the B input of the 74 and the 382, and we'll set the carry to zero, and, and we'll set these selectors to perform the addition operation. Now the next instruction we want to support is add with carry, and so add with carry, uh, in that case, is, it's almost identical to a simple addition, only we want the carry input for that addition to actually come from uh, whatever the carry was on some previous uh, add instruction which might have been higher up in our program. And the reason is we use that instruction if we want to add 16-bit numbers together. So we start with the with the lower 8 bits and, and they will result in either a carry out or not a carry out. And then the next instruction should be an add with carry so it should add together the high order 8 bits of both operands and, and it should then um, also take into account a carry which might have occurred when the previous operation happened. So in fact that's exactly the same as a, as a simple addition, only the carry input should come from our register which uh, will have latched whatever the carry output was of, of the previous operation. And then we come to, su to the subtract operation. And so for subtraction uh, we have a, an a minus b function which is provided by the 74LS382 so we can use that. Once again we'll hook the A inputs to the bus and the B inputs to the B register but of course uh, since we're performing a subtraction we, we need to remember that the carry and the borrow flags have, have uh, inverted meanings and so to, to say that we're performing a subtraction without borrows uh, we in fact we need to set the borrow to zero which means we need to set the carry input to one. And so this is how we need to configure the 74LS382 in order to provide a subtraction. Um, now, for a subtract with carry, uh, we're in the same situation that we were in with an add with carry. So what we want to do here is, is also a subtraction of, of the bus input from the B register input. But of course, the carry flag shouldn't be hard coded. It should be set to whatever the result was of, of the previous uh, subtraction operation. And so just as in with add with carry, we're going to perform exactly the same as a, as a normal subtraction, only the carry input will be set by whatever is latched in the flags register from the previous operation. Now a compare instruction is actually a subtraction instruction. The only difference is that uh, once the, the ALU operation has been completed and, and the result has been computed, we're not going to store it back into the into whatever register it came from, but uh, as we saw, we'll we'll take care of that simply by uh, in in the second step, uh, in the second clock cycle of our ALU instruction, uh, the we we won't enable the ALU register, um, but as far as the 74 LS 382 is concerned, there's no difference between that and a real subtraction. So uh, to perform that operation, the, for the, the, the 74 LS 382 should behave in, in exactly the same way. So, so there's no difference between a subtraction and a compare. Now the next instruction is AND. That's a, that's a logical uh, bitwise operation. And uh, conveniently, the 74 LS 382 provides uh, this AND as one of the possibilities for uh, its uh, three functions which it provides. And so again, we'll be hooking up the A inputs to the bus, so we can get whatever register is outputting on there. And the B inputs will be hard wired to the B register. And the carry flag uh, will set to zero. In, in fact, it doesn't really matter for these logical operations, because carry doesn't have meaning. Uh, but we'll just set it to zero, and then the carry out will also become zero. Now, a logical OR operation uh, is also provided directly by the 74LS382, and so we can use that in exactly the same way that, that we use the AND operation. And the same goes for the exclusive OR. So the, the 74 ls 382 provides a combination of these uh, selector bits which will implement a, an exclusive OR. And once again, we wire the A input to the bus and the B input to the B register, and we don't set the carry. Now the next instruction we need to support is a, is a bitwise NOT. So, so we need to invert or flip every single bit in the input. Um, and that function isn't provided. It, it isn't one of the six operations that are natively supported by the 74LS382. So uh, in this case, um, what we're going to do is we're going to use the information uh, that, that we've recently discovered about subtractions. So if you remember uh, a subtraction or, or a, 
binary subtraction circuit uh, is in fact the same as a binary addition circuit where we have inverted one of the inputs uh, the second input and where we have inverted the meaning of the carry signals so if I were to set my 74 LS382 to perform a subtraction but not the A minus B subtraction but the B minus A subtraction remember we support that um, and if at the same time I arrange for that B input to be hard co hard wired to zero so something like this what's going to happen in that case well what's going to happen is that uh, the 74 LS382 doesn't invert the carry signal into a borrow signal that's something we have to do manually so if we don't do it if we leave the carry input at zero all that the the 74 LS382 will do is it will invert the, in, in this case the A input because it's the second input to the minus operation so it will invert all of these bits and then it will add them together to, to, to its first input be because that's what a subtraction circuit is it, it's, a, it's an addition circuit where one of the inputs has been inverted and so if we add the inverse of the bus input to zero we will get the inverse of the bus input and since we set carry in to zero it, it won't add any carry bits and so what we'll have as a result of this operation is in fact exactly the inverse of whatever's on the bus in. and so very conveniently this combination of, of input signals into the 74RS382 will provide us with a NOT operation of course up until now uh, we've always been considering that this, this, this B, this second input into the ALU could be either the B register or could be m 1 or minus 1 but, but in this case it, we actually need it to be 0 uh, because if it were anything else than 0 then that value would get added to this inverse of A and, and that's not what we want we really want the inverse of, of the uh, bus input and nothing else uh, so we really need a 0 input here as well and so here is one of these instructions which uh, which up until now we've, we've been considering as, a, as simply adding a 1 so uh, we could of course do that we could say we want the A plus B operation and the first input should be the bus input which will be this register and the second input should be a 1 but then we need a selector that needs to select among three different possible inputs for the second operand and, and that seems a little bit uh, inconvenient um, we can actually use a trick. If we set the carry to 1 for an, for an add operation, so if this is A plus B, then setting the carry to 1 simply means we need to calculate the addition of the two operands and add an extra 1. And so if we set that to 1 and this to 0, well, that will have exactly the same meaning. That will add both of these, which is 0 plus 1, which is 1, to the operand, uh, which we're uh, inputting from the bus and indirectly from the register. Uh, and so by setting up the 74 LS382 in this way, we will actually increase the value which is coming in by 1. And that's exactly what we want. Now for a decrease operation, we can do something extremely similar. A decrease means subtracting 1. And so we could say, uh, we once again, we, we want to perform an A minus B, and we want the A input to be the register, which we're interested in, which is going to come in through the bus, and we want the B input to be 1. And then we want to perform a subtraction, and so we would set the carry flag to 1, because we want the borrow to be 0, um, and that would perform a minus 1. But we can do something else, if, because uh, if, we have a, if we actually have a borrow, during a subtraction operation what that means is we will be subtracting the second operand from the first operand and in addition we will be subtracting one from the borrow so if we set borrow to one i.e. carry in to zero and set the second operand to zero we will also be uh, affecting a, a, a subtraction 
of the fixed value of the borrow, which is 1, because carrying is 0. And so by wiring up the 74LS382 in this way, we will in fact calculate the value which is coming in minus 1. Now a push operation, as we saw, um, is in fact uh, an operation uh, is, is in fact a memory operation using the stack pointer but in addition we want to subtract one from the stack pointer so we really we want to perform a decrease of the stack pointer so we'll just wire it up exactly in the same way of course the input will be the stack pointer but we'll still input that via the bus and we'll just have the control logic make sure that the stack pointer is outputting its value onto the bus and a pop operation is exactly the opposite, so uh, we want to, once again, access memory using the stack pointer, but we want to increase the value of the stack pointer by 1. So, in fact, we want to uh, do an increase of, of the stack pointer, and so we're going to use exactly the same setup that we had here, uh, but we'll be inputting the value of the stack pointer rather than the register uh, that we're writing a value to from memory. And so here we see that uh, by using the correct combinations of carry inputs, A inputs and B inputs, and uh, the selector of one of these six operations that the 74LS382 provides, we are actually able to implement all 11 ALU instructions that we want to provide to our programmer. So that's pretty good. So it, it, it turns out that the 74LS382 is a pretty good choice for our ALU, uh, in particular for providing all of these operations. And as we can see, uh, the way we need to wire it up is, is these three signals will need to be provided by the control logic, uh, because only it will be able to know what the instruction is that the programmer has, has said he wants executed, and so he's going to decode that instruction and then set these three signals according to the program, programmer's desire. Um, and it will also need to set this carry flag, because whether it's a 0 or a 1, or whether it should be read from the flags register, uh, that's something that only the control logic will know, because only the control logic knows what the particular instruction is uh, that's being executed. And these values depend on, on, on that instruction. On the other hand, the A inputs, uh, well, we can permanently hook those up to the bus. That's, uh, that will work, because in all cases, we're inputting some register, so all we need to do is uh, organize the control logic so that it outputs whatever register uh, we're interested in onto the bus, and in these cases that's the actual register from the instructions, and in these two cases that's, that's the stack pointer, but the control logic can, can take care of that. So the A inputs can, can be wired directly to the bus. And the B inputs here, and, and here is the interesting part, uh, because we've been using this carry flag in, in, a, in a slightly clever way, and this carry flag is, is completely under the control of the control unit, we can actually hardwire the B input in all of these cases to zero. We don't need to wire it to one or minus one or, or any other value. All we need is to be able to select either the B register or zero. And as long as we can choose from one of those two possibilities, so we really we only need one bit, and we saw in the last episode that we have such a bit, it's the ALU uh, B selector signal, uh, well then we can decide uh, uh, what the B input will be to the ALU, because it will only ever need either the B register or a hardwired value of zero. And everything else will be controlled through this carry input flag and these three input signals uh, to, to select one of the six operations. And so now we see uh, what these four input signals are, which, which I was talking about in the last episode, that determine the operation we want the ALU to perform. So they are in fact the carry input to the 74LS382 and these three selector inputs to the 74LS382. And so those four bits together will in fact determine which of these operations is being performed. Uh, and, and that's how it will impl be implemented. And so the job of actually implementing that, of selecting uh, the correct inputs on all of these four wires, well, that will be the job of the control logic. So now, finally, we're in a position to understand completely how 
uh, we want to wire up the various parts of our ALU. And so the, the core of the ALU will be two instances of this uh, 74 LS382. So here is one of them for the low order 4 bits, and here is another one for the high order 4 bits. And so the first thing we do is we take the carry output of this low order bits uh, ALU and we uh, connect that to the carry input of the high order ALU. And so the carry input of, of the entire ALU will be the carry input here of the lower one. And so we connect that directly to a control signal for the control logic. And this is uh, the ALU carry in. And uh, these uh, function selector signals, so these uh, S0, S1, and S2 signals, well, they should be the same on both chips, so we connect those up together. And then we allow, once again, the control logic to simply set them. And so they'll determine uh, which of the six operations that these chips support will be performed. And as we just saw, by, by setting the correct combination of these three signals and the carry input signal, and by connecting the, the, the second input uh, using this control wire, the control logic is going to be able to uniquely determine one of, in fact, 11 operations that this ALU should perform. So as we said, the A inputs will, in all circumstances, come in from the bus. And so here it is. And as you can see, the low order bits of the A inputs are all connected directly to the bus. Uh, and the high order bits are connected to the high order input lines from the bus. And that's permanent. But on the other hand, the B inputs, uh, they could in some cases come from the B register, which, which would be connected up here. And in some cases, they should be all zeros. And so in, in digital circuitry, all zero means connections to ground. So what we have here are two selectors, 274, in my case, HCT 157s. And so they provide the possibility of performing a selection of either the contents of the B register or hardwired zero, so hardwired to ground. So these B inputs on these two selectors are all hardwired to ground. And so that will ensure that if this selector signal is set, and that will happen if this A or B, if, this, if we do not select the B register, so in fact this is an, uh, an active low signal, then we'll be selecting these, these ground wires, which will be zero, but, but if, if that is low, meaning we do want the B register, well then we'll actually be selecting the B register. And so the outputs of those selectors, in fact, go to the B inputs of these ALU chips. So we have one for the low order bits and one for the high order bits. And the output of the ALU, so the, the calculated values, once again, here we have the low order bits and here we have the high order bits, well, they all go into the inputs of this register, which we talked about in the last episode, uh, and that register will be activated whenever this ALU write signal is asserted. And so that will simply tell this register to latch the contents that, that these ALUs at any particular time of, uh, are calculating. Um, because remember, once again, these A inputs are connected directly to the bus without any kind of filtering or buffering. So whatever's on the bus, that's gonna go immediately into the A inputs of these ALUs. And that will immediately produce a result. And as soon as these A inputs change, i.e. as soon as the bus changes, well, so will these outputs. So we need to latch the output, and that's what we do with this register. And so finally, the output of that register uh, is what we see on the LEDs. Um, and the output of that register, we can send back to the bus using one final control signal, which is the ALU enable signal. And that one too we talked about in the last episode. And so we, have, uh, we need the clock just for this single register. Um, uh, and, and those are, in fact, uh, apart from the reset, which doesn't come from the control unit, those are the control signals uh, that the control unit will manipulate in order to provide all of the functions of, in our ALU. 
And so the one thing we haven't talked about yet is, is the flags. So uh, remember, we have four flags, zero, negative, overflow, and carry. Now, carry, uh, you can probably uh, guess that comes from the carry out of this high order ALU. There's also a, a assigned overflow, which we get directly from the ALU. The negative flag, which is this one, uh, is in fact connected to the highest order bit of the result, of this F3, because uh, both these overflow and negative flags, uh, only they, they assume that we're using a, a two's complement representation of negative numbers. And in that scheme, negative simply means that the highest order bit is one. So that flag, in, in fact, simply says if, if the highest order bit is a one or not. And the final flag is the zero flag, and the zero flag uh, is unfortunately not provided by this ALU, so we need a final bit of circuitry up here, which in fact does a huge not or of uh, all of the input lines. So uh, the zero flag should only ever be one if all the inputs are zero. So we, we nor all of them together, and the result of that is the zero flag. And as we discussed uh, in the last episode, the, the flags are also latched at exactly the same time as the uh, uh, output result from the ALU. And so it too has an enable signal. Uh, in fact, it has two because this is a 74 LS173, which for whatever reason has two inputs, which we try together, and they're connected to that same ALU write signal. So having seen uh, how we implement our, our ALU and how we connect up the various chips together, uh, let's have a look at it in, in action. And uh, so at the moment, uh, the computer is about to execute uh, this decrease instruction here. So decrease the value of the D register. And as we can see, the D register right now has a value of 3. And so let's have a look at, at what the control logic is doing. So it's first of all, it's telling the D register to output its contents on the bus. And so here they are. Here's the 3, which is in the D register. And so that, uh, those bus contents uh, are automatically connected to the first inputs of our ALU, the first operand, uh, because that's hardwired to the bus. Now let's have a look at the, at the relevant control logic signals. Um, so first of all, uh, this uh, ALU B signal at the moment is not asserted. So what that means is that the second operand to uh, our 74 LS382s right now uh, isn't coming from the B register, uh, but is instead uh, being redirected by these uh, selector chips to the hardwired ground signal, uh, which is provided by all of these black connections to ground, which you can see here. And so uh, the ALU is going to is at this moment uh, receiving on its two input lines, or, or rather the 74 LS382s are receiving the bus contents, which are three, uh, and the second input is is a zero. And now if you have a look at what the control logic is telling, or which operation it's telling the, the 74LS382s to perform, um, notice that, that these are backwards, so that the highest order uh, S signal bit is, is this one. Uh, so what we're really seeing is a, is a low, high, low signal. And if we look at the data sheet, uh, a low, high, low signal means uh, A minus B, so first operand minus second operand. And so in our case, uh, that would be 3, which is the D register, minus 0. Uh, but of course, there's a, one other thing which we need to uh, pay attention to, and that's the uh, carry input, which the control logic is also sending to the 74 LS382s. Uh, and since we're performing a subtraction operation, uh, A minus B, uh, we need to remember that the, the carry input is in fact the inverse of the borrow input. And so uh, since the, the, the carry input is, is low, what, what we're actually doing is, is telling the, the uh, ALU chips here, uh, we want you to simulate a, a borrow. So uh, we want you to calculate uh, A minus B, so 3 minus uh, 0, and additionally subtract an extra 1, uh, because we're setting the borrow input to high, i.e. the carry to low. And so uh, the, A, the 74 LS382s are already performing that calculation right now, and so if we were to have a look at the outputs from these two chips, we'd probably already see the value 2. Uh, and, but for it to show up on these LEDs, uh, what we need is, is the last um, uh, control signal coming from the control logic here, which is to write or to latch the value coming out of the uh, 74 LS382s into our ALU register. And that will happen on the next rising clock edge. 
And so if I advance the clock by one cycle, indeed, we see a 2 here. And so the result of all that is, was indeed to subtract 1 from the value of the deregister, which was a 3, and so now we have a 2 here. And so in this next cycle, uh, we're, we're no longer using the 74 LS382s, uh, bec because we're not writing, we're not latching into that register. We already have our calculation result, uh, which we're interested in. And so in this last step, we're going to output that onto the bus, and that's the reason why we have a 2 on the bus right now. And that 2, uh, on the next rising clock edge, will be latched back into the deregister. And so one more clock cycle later, we have in fact completed the operation of decreasing the value of D. Now another important thing to realize uh, is that during the execution of this decrease instruction, which was in fact a subtraction, uh, of course the, our ALU uh, also latched the flags, uh, which, which resulted from the computation which took place. And since it was a subtraction, uh, from, for a subtraction, uh, the, the carry-in is the opposite of, of the borrow-in, but of course the carry-out is also the opposite of the borrow-out. And since we subtracted uh, 1 from 3, which resulted in a 2, uh, no, carry occur no borrow occurred during this subtraction. And because no borrow occurred, meaning borrow-out is 0, in fact the carry-out is 1, and as you can see the carry at this moment is set. So for subtraction operations, uh, even in the program code, uh, the, the carry bit takes on the opposite meaning of, of the borrow bit. And so the programmer in, on my computer needs to be aware of that. And so if we look at uh, the next instruction after this uh, decrease of the D instruction, we indeed see a jump carry. So, so we test to find out whether that, that decrease uh, actually uh, caused a borrow. And so if carry is set, it means uh, no borrow occurred. And, and that's why the jump occurs to something called uh, continue. And, and so this code is what happens in the case that we did have a borrow. Now, we didn't have a borrow, and therefore the, the carry is set, and so on the next instruction, on this jump carry, uh, first we need to go and fetch it, um, you'll see that we are actually going to execute the jump, because carry is set, and so we're going to read, first of all, point uh, the program counter, uh, point memory at the address in the program counter, so we'll write that into the memory address register, and then go and fetch the new address that, that we will jump to and write that back into the program counter. And so because uh, this was a subtraction, which resulted in no borrow, the carry output was set. And so this uh, jump carry occurred. And so now the computer is posed for this add instruction, which will once again involve the ALU. So uh, let's load in that add instruction, and there it is. So now, uh, what is the control logic uh, telling the ALU to do. So first of all, uh, this time the C register is being enabled, so that's this value of 10, is going onto the bus and, and therefore going into the first input of our 74 LS382s. Now this time the second input uh, will come from the B register because uh, uh, this control signal, the, the ALU B control signal, is active and so these selectors uh, are going to select their B register inputs which are coming in on all of these green lines. And so the second input to the to these 74 LS 382s will be the B register, which is 5. So we have a first input of 10 and a second input of 5. And so the operation which the control logic is telling them to perform, in this case is, once again, right to left, uh, low, high, high. And so if we look at uh, the data sheet, uh, low, high, high is A plus B. Uh, and that certainly makes sense since we're executing an add instruction of uh, C and B together. And so this time, uh, the, the carry in is also not set, but of course for an, for an addition operation, th that, is, uh, that means uh, we, we don't want to add anything else. So we'll purely be adding 5 and 10, uh, because the carry in is not set. And so uh, this last signal, once again, is to, to write or latch the result of the computation, which, which is already on these wires. The, these 74 LS382s are, are already, have already worked out that the result is 15 that 15 will be latched uh, into this register and shown on these LEDs on the next rising clock edge. And of course, uh, this addition of 5 plus 10 equals 15 also didn't cause a carry. And so for an, for an add operation, uh, the carry will, will become unset. And so this, this uh, LED will go off on the next rising clock edge. And so there it is, the result of the computation, uh, 15, was latched into this register and, and the flags were latched into this register. And so now, once again, the final step is to output the contents which we latched into this ALU register 
onto the bus and there is the 15 and, and then uh, write them back into the C register, into here. And so that concludes that add instruction. And so now hopefully, after uh, all of this work and all of these explanations, uh, we've come to uh, understand how uh, I was able to implement this ALU in, in, in fact, one and a half breadboards, one of them for the computation and then another half one to deal with the flags, um, uh, in which I support 11 distinct uh, arithmetic and logical operations. And, and we ran fewer, uh, through a few of them here. And so uh, the, the operation of the ALU uh, is now completely uh, driven by whatever these control signals uh, from the control logic tell it to do. And of course, we'll be looking at the control logic in some future episode. Uh, but so the, the ALU um, is now hopefully, has, has hopefully been demystified. Now, what I would like to do in the next episode um, is have a quick look at, uh, at this decimal display, which we have... Uh, hooked up to the A register. And so at the moment, uh, it's showing a value of five uh, in decimal. And so uh, the, the way this is built is, is almost a one-to-one -one copy of, of what Benita did. Uh, we're using an EEPROM and we're multiplexing it uh, across the various digits. Um, the, the, one, of the more, one of the larger differences between uh, what I did and what Benita did is, is not really in, in the way things are wired up, but, but in the software which I use uh, on my EEPROM programmer here to uh, program this Arduino, which is on there, um, uh, and, and that allows me to program these EEPROMs, um, in this case to display uh, decimal digits from binary numbers. Uh, and, and so uh, I've organized that software, the Arduino software, a little bit differently. And so we'll have a look at that in the next episode. So uh, see you all then.